the moment. Our fellow geeks, weebs, nerds, and other unfortunates have been fervently waiting for has finally arrived. It's time for TMI Confessionals of the Nerd Confessionals Kind. Of the nerd Confessionals kind. of the Nerd Kind. And now, your host. Jeff Nerfherder Chandler, Jim Kaiju Baker, and Mike Mjolnir Evans. And now, let's get on with the show. Here is TMI. We're doing this for our own satisfaction, and all the people want to join. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome. Hey, here we are. Well, two of us, at least. Two of us today. Yeah, Mike is not with us as he's mm-hmm. feeling ill. He's feeling the effects of jet lag, I think. He was out scouting locations again? He was, yeah. yeah. In, the, in the southern region of the United States. Oh, I was hoping he was going to Wakanda. We've mentioned this before, but has anybody out there found any of our postcards? <laughs> that... love to know if that's what brought you to this show. If you're listening because of one of those postcards out there. Let us know. Email us, tmipodcast2018 at gmail.com. I'd like to know. I'd like to know as well. Jeff worked so. hard on those things. Yeah, all of five minutes. Yeah, so, so we're back yes, after a, three episodes, a, three back-to-back-to-back episodes of the five bucket list. Five buckets. So Very, we hope uh, you've enjoyed them. We've put the invitation out there for any of you listeners to share with us your five bucket suggestions, but that hasn't happened yet. No. So if you would like to see something or hear something on this show that you think has gotten short shrift, shift, shrift, is that is shrift, it shrift? Shrifted, oh, shrift, shafted, let us know and we will consider it. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's a given. <laughs> it doesn't mean that we're going to all agree that it's five bucket, but hey, we'll give you a shout out. Well, I think that I think what we agreed that uh, not all three of us had to be completely in line. Yeah. At for least a five two of bucket. us would have to agree. I think right, two and a half. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I think if uh, the two of us uh, push for uh, the incredible Mister Limp, it might might actually have to walk away forever. You would never hear him again. Oh, de- yeah, he might develop at least a sudden illness for that show. Yes, correct for that very episode. So he couldn't be Bummer. dragged in by implication. <laughs> so we're back with uh with new releases this week. We're off the nostalgia train for now, at least, you know, that that's running on a regular schedule. Oh, I'm, I'm, show, I'm but, on board that thing 24-7. Yeah. But we're into the new stuff. Today. So we're covering Glass as our new feature. And of course, we cannot talk Glass without talking both Unbreakable and Split. So it's another threefer rather than a twofer episode. There you go. Twofer, twofer. I don't even know her. Uh, <laughs> how crazy is this that we have actually <laughs> waited 19 years for this movie? But we didn't even know we were waiting. That's the uh, well, some That's of us did. Some of us see. I will tell you right now. I am unabashedly in love with Unbreakable. I love this movie. When I saw it in the theater, uh, I've probably pushed and promoted it to anybody who would listen to my rants. I will say that the one good thing with this glass coming out, if it forced people to go back and said, "Let me go check that movie out or rewatch it," then I think that regardless of how Glass uh, is received, mission accomplished. What do we have for news? Uh, let's see. So, uh, yeah, it's been pretty slow leading into this year, but uh, the, a couple of things have popped up. Some of it's not necessarily new news, but uh, stuff we'll talk about anyways, which is, I don't know if you saw, there was a little teaser trailer that kind of dropped maybe about a week or so ago, revealing the Ecto-1. Yes, I did see this. This is controversy. So, very controversial, because this has been in talks for years, a Ghostbuster 3, a direct sequel to the second movie with the original cast. Obviously, Harold Ramis is no longer with us, so that's kind of a sad downer but uh you've read on and off that bill murray wants no part of it you know i think dan Aykroyd really pushed for a long time but then all of a sudden this trailer just out of nowhere now last year two years ago was it 2016 that the the all-female version of ghostbuster movie came out i think it may have been last year last year 2017 yeah yeah. okay uh regardless that was a a reboot it was a standalone and this one is a direct sequel tie-in and it is being directed by uh, Ivan Reitman's son, Jason, 
Now, Ivan Reitman was the original director of Ghostbusters. And Jason, as a little kid, was on set during the filming of the original Ghostbusters. So he's got a quite storied history with the making of this movie. Uh, and I guess he went to his father and actually pitched the story. And he said, you know what? Let's make it happen. But the big mystery is, does it have Bill Murray? You know, how that can they do mystery. it without Bill Murray? I think, you know what? And even say what you will about the um, Melissa McCarthy uh, version. You can't, it's got to be, it's got to be a, a handing of the baton off to a younger group. You're going to have cameos by these guys. They're not going to be front and center. Maybe, maybe they're all dead and another group's got to come and save them from the netherworld. Maybe, maybe Bill Murray will be a zombie from zombie land. Right. I don't know. I, I thought it was interesting. To be honest with you, if, if you've seen the trailer, it's really just a quick little tease, a little pan shot through the woods in an abandoned shack and the tarp lifts up on a vehicle and you just see the Ecto-1. The, the, the original yeah. Ecto-1. Yeah. I think the controversy aspect of, of this is that this kind of negates that all female Ghostbusters, which I've read, it definitely does not take place in the same universe as this new movie. This new movie is a direct as you right. said, sequel to the original. So yeah. it's as if this all female driven Ghostbusters never happened. Right. So I, I know that at least one of the cast members, uh, Leslie Jones, is disgruntled about this. Of course. As of she course. should be, you know, you know. Nobody wants to see their work negated. Exactly. So, so we got that going. That's pretty interesting. The other trailer, which was Spider-Man Far From Home, dropped. And uh, I don't know about you, but do you have any concerns or issues with the fact that this is showing up before we even see Endgame? Well, there's an argument to be had there that this is kind of spoiling. Of course. I mean, we all know that there was another Spider-Man movie in the works. We all know there's another Doctor Strange right. movie in the works. But... Right. It's, it's kind of like, oh, there he is. And Nick Fury, you see Nick Fury front and center. So we all know that everything gets kind of reset. So I think it's kind of taken a little bit of the piss out of. It and has, but really, I think Marvel is very aware that we know that they could never kill off these characters in the manner that they did and have it be permanent. It's just a question of how they come back, not if they come back. So maybe that's where they're going with this. They know that we know that all these movies are on the slate. They can't hide it. So, so they know that we know that they know. They, yes, and they're, yeah. they're kind and of- And we do know, have, right? They have I just, to market. I'm just playing devil's advocate. Yeah. That, that they have to you. market this movie, right? They have to keep these things that is, going. I, yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. And I'm not taking anything away from it. It looks good. You know, Jake Gyllenhaal, that's, you know, Mysterio. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, I, for one, am all for Mysterio because I think rehashing the same villains over and over again as the Spider-Man series was wont to do for a while there yeah. is not the direction to go. And they have that so is, many supervillains that they can mine in, in the Spider-Man comic. Yeah, yeah. And that is, I think, one of the gripes that has already shown up online is the fact that you see uh, Sandman. You, you get a taste of all the elementals. You, you get uh, Hydro Man, you get Sandman. There's a, there's a couple scenes where it looks like Mysterio is fighting these guys. And now if anybody has ever read a comic book with Mysterio in it, you know he's got these special effects powers of the hypnosis or whatever. So my take is, is that he's manufacturing these creatures to make it look like he's a hero and saving the day. I'm, I'm laying it out there right now, that, that yeah. these are not actually the characters you think they are that's why i love mysterio so much it's like he doesn't really have any superpowers it's just all his technical ability and whatever, yeah i think he you saw know. that movie fx years ago and uh, he was like i can do that i kind of equate him with the scarecrow from the batman series yeah you know, he's got and i think in the comics mysterio also blended his uh fx mastery with mind-bending drugs so yeah yeah that little... well, don't we all yeah. <laughs> So. <laughs> to, give, to give that little edge to his stuff. But it always used to end whenever Spider-Man would figure it out and swing right through whatever illusion it was, he would just, you know, smash that dome and then he'd be done. He'd be done. Yeah, all I got to do, do is take out that fishbowl. Uh, the only other news, and this I don't even know if this is news per se, uh, but again, online there's this big push all of a sudden to have Michael Keaton cast as old man uh, Bruce Wayne in the Batman Beyond movie. I don't even know if this is really a thing, but the... I will tell you, when we, when we talked Batman a while back and we were, uh, our confessional question was uh, brought up, you know, favorite Batman, 
I completely missed the ball on bringing Batman Beyond as my favorite Batman. Really? So you would because revisit that? Absolutely. Question? Absolutely love that series. It is probably the, the opening animation is probably one of the greatest outside of Thundercats, I'm going to say, in the last ever. Are you familiar with the show at all? I am not. I am uh, not. Well worth picking up. And I think oh, I've been out of the loop and this is where we need Mike. But I, I believe that they've brought this character uh, into the DC universe. So when and where did this Batman Beyond show air? Oh, geez. Probably back in the late 90s. And it was, you know, an old weathered Bruce Wayne. Uh, he was hiding out in his little bat cave and kind of disgruntled and crotchety. And uh, this kid basically discovers who and what he was and he steals his technology. And so they end up working together, but they bring back the Joker and, and you know, the, there's yeah. for different versions of the characters. It was well done. It was the kid. I'm going to draw a blank. We will Friedman. I think his name was, he was on the, he was on the show. Um, I can't remember. His name. <laughs> I, 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 I only had one note on this. <laughs> This is usually the uh, the part of the show that we get to talk about some trailers and that since we both saw Glass just as yes. in the past okay. couple of days, I'm sure you got some. Uh, again, I saw the Godzilla King of the Monsters. Yeah, trailer. this was a first. I, I had not seen this. This was a lot more. This was monster centric. Yeah, it was so. visceral. It was great. And, yeah. you know, and again, it was the same trailer I saw last time, but it gets the blood pump and I want to see this movie really bad. Yeah, I hope and it lives up. It, because Glass is sort of a horror suspense centric movie there's a lot of horror trailers that i got before and one of them is called us which is the new jordan peele movie who he directed get out as you uh, may be familiar with i and did i watched it. completely freaky did you see this trailer i did and it looks no, it looks to the point where i don't want to see it <laughs> don't make me see it <laughs> but i will tell you get out was brilliant I loved it. It yeah. was not what I expected. So maybe it looks freaky. That's for sure. Yes, it does. And I did read that uh, Jordan Peele was trying to go for a more straight ahead horror movie while oh, still really? trying to uh, keep some of that irreverence that Get Out had. Yeah. Okay. So. All right. Well, if he pulls that off, he's got some nice creds right there. So, and then I saw a new Dark Phoenix trailer. I don't know if you yeah, saw that. Yeah, well, that's... Now they pulled that because I think it was originally slated to come out in the fall and then they backed off on that but uh it looks good i'm if they can if they can negate x-men 3 last stand then i'm all for it <laughs> i think they're still trying to do that the logan movie it, it did make a case for it but didn't quite erase the memory in my no, head of no. last stand. yeah i know so uh so speaking of trailers did you also see happy death day to you yes I did. I, I, no, I'm not. I did never saw the first one, but they basically give you the entire movie, and this looks pretty. Clever. It's like a horror version of Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. What it is? Exactly yeah. what it is. Yeah. Now, if we had actually reviewed Groundhog Day, this would have been a great pairing. Well, there or we go. Edge of tomorrow or Edge yeah. of Tomorrow. We could still do that. Let's do Happy Day. Death Day too, and do Groundhog Day along with but it. But now, then I'd be forced to watch Happy Death Day just so I understand. But that's all the news I have. So oh. I just read something that we oh, almost oh, oh, oh. lost James McAvoy last year. What? That he, yeah, there was just something I read today that came up online that last year he didn't disclose this until now, but he had a, um, a shadow on his lung biopsy last year, which turned out to be nothing in itself, but he got a bad infection and was in the hospital for a few weeks and was close to death, apparently. So, How, um, it's amazing that these guys hide stuff like that. I mean, I that. In this day and age, we got TMZ like hiding in your bathroom. Wow, that's well it's scary. We're glad he survived. Yeah, I'm glad he survived. One of our best actors, I think. Well, we're gonna get into it when yeah. not only Split, but in this movie. Yeah. So let's get into it. Do you want to start okay. chronologically? We start I think we have to. I think we have to. Okay. So Unbreakable, the first in a trilogy, as we said previously, yeah. they're calling it the East Trail One Seventy Seven trilogy. I've not even heard that East no, really? Trail. This what is, is the name that, that you train refer to? Bruce Willis was on. Oh, the, the 177. So this train runs right through all three of these movies, yeah. really. You don't really know it in Split, but by the end of Glass, you see how yeah. it all correlates. So the, the basic story is we've got Bruce Willis as a commuter. He works uh, as a security guard, and I think he's going for on a new job interview. I think that's why he's Yes, he New York. He's, he's looking to travel to New York. He was coming back from New York. The train derails. 
killing everybody aboard except for David Dunn, who is Bruce Willis's character. Anyone going through something like that has to question life after, after such an event, but he is contacted by Elijah Price, played by Sam Jackson, who, and I don't know the name of the condition, but he's got a condition where he is extremely frail. His Real bone, bone disease is what he referred to it as, but I'm sure that there's a medical term. Right. His bones are brittle, so they're easily broken. So as a child, um, what did he, how many breaks did he say he had? In uh, he, well, uh, in, in, uh, in this last one, Glassy mentions that his, he's had 94 breaks. Right. But he was, but he was broken at birth, broken which is at birth, a yeah. very, a very disturbing. Now his mom gave birth to him in Gimbel's, right, or what? Yeah, it was yeah. an apartment store. And the doctor, the horrified look on his face, you would think that the, she's birthing the, uh, you know, it's alive from. Right. He's like, did you, did you drop this baby? And she's yeah. like, what? He was, did you, did you drop this? Baby? Yeah. No, it's, it's a very disturbing scene. It is. So he bends his childhood in and out of hospitals. And he becomes obsessed with comic books as, as thanks to his mom. Thanks to his mom. Yes. Yep. Who, who brought him his first issue. Yeah. And as an adult, obviously he still has this condition. So he's still in a very frail weakened state, but now he's a, a serious art collector. Uh, and a little too serious. A little too serious. I believe comics are our last link to an ancient way of passing on history. The Egyptians drew on walls. Countries all over the world still pass on knowledge through pictorial forms. I believe comics are a form of history. And he has a theory that if someone like him exists in the world, that is the epitome of frailty, then he must have an opposite out there who is the epitome of strength. And this is all based on his intense comic book knowledge. So he's got this theory based on what he's read all of his life. He thinks it's David Dunn just on the just because of the fact that he survived this train crash right. and gets into contact with him and is trying to convince him that he is something more than human and he really he really makes david think question it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. asking you if you never sick? been sick yeah. now i think though really if you have never been sick you would know that it would kind of be like a bragging point for me like oh i've never been sick i've never taken a sick day but he you know he can't remember so to add to the little suspense there yeah. Got to ask his wife, have I ever been sick? And nobody can quite remember it or pinpoint it. So, so David thinks that Elijah is a nutcase to begin Which with. Which he is. He <laughs> really is, yeah. <laughs> his to say it, his theories he really have no basis in reality. They're, they are total off-the-wall theories that David shouldn't take seriously, but it kind of is, it eats at him through the movie that, you know, could this be correct? And there's that great scene when he is lifting weights with his son and this kid just keeps adding weights. And they're, they're like, like taping, taping paint cans to the end. And yeah. he's like, he goes, how much more? And he goes, that was everything. And that's the great thing, which is, first of all, for whatever reason in my head, I kept thinking this was Haley Joel Osment, and it's not. It's not, no. It's, it's very a, similar. It, you know, I can see why. It's very yeah, similar got, looking kid. Yep, Spencer Tree Clark. And he really sells the idea. Like, he's the, he's, the kid is, like, con absolutely convinced that what Elijah is telling his father is true to the point where like he takes a gun and he's like pointing his dad, yeah. dad, you won't get hurt. You won't. And so story wise, this movie is crazy. It's, you know, it defies logic, but go back to the fact that this was 2000. This was really well before Marvel's reign of superhero movies. It came it out the same and it year. It kind of coincided with the first X-Men movie. Yeah, it came out the same year as X-Men, but really nobody was talking comic book superheroes but this was like superheroes in a very grounded. Now we already, we, I mean, we had, you know, the Batmans of the world out there. We had the Michael Keaton Batman movies, but those were very comic booky. And this right. is not. And one of the detractions from this movie is that it's very slow plotting. It's very quiet and it's very unassuming. And that's what I love about it is, which is it's, I love the quietness of it that this, you can almost hear like like the gears in this guy's head thinking right. like what is this guy doing to me what what you know what is going on and that uh, is actually the issue i had with it when i first saw it because <laughs> it was never that really high in my estimation even after the first viewing because i just thought it was too slow and plotting and and bruce was uh as david dunn was just so laconic in his performance and all yeah. 
scenes with the camera going from him to Robin Wright. From so him so Robin let's talk Wright. about that a little bit because I, so again, did you see this when it first came out in the theater? Yes, I did. Oh, you did? Okay. I did. Because this, this like, I went to go see this by myself. I, my, my daughter was born around that time and I just went to the movies. I saw this and I came back and spent probably the same amount of time it took me to see the movie to explain this entire movie blow by blow to my wife because I was so taken by it. And it took me years to find other people who actually appreciated this movie for what it was. Yeah, and um, it wouldn't have been me back then. No. <laughs> it would not have been me. But did you watch it? Did you rewatch it again for? Yes, I did. For this, and, for this show, okay. I did. The first time since 2000, I think I rewatched it. I just, and you obviously watched it before we watched Glass. Yes. Okay, so uh, change your opinion a little bit, a little more appreciative of it, uh, yes, or were yes. you still like, oh yeah, this Although is Although cool. I actually had more appreciation with it on its own, not thinking about Split and not thinking right. about Glass. Yeah. The reason being is because I like to think, because you do get some of that um, telekinesis ability that David has when he's brushing past people in his job as a security guard. So he can right. see all their evil deeds, you know? So, so that is kind of unmistakable that he has that ability. But watching this again, I kind of would like to think that he is not a superhero. That the message of this movie and kind of into Split is like, you are what you think you are. That's what Split really says is that this character of Kevin has all these personalities. One of them's a diabetic because the mind is so powerful that it makes that persona a diabetic when, you're, when your body is not diabetic with all the other personas. So I was fascinated by the idea that David may be willing himself to believe that he has these abilities. Like you hear about a mother um, with adrenaline rush lifting a car yes. off of her infant, yep. you know? Okay. So, uh, so I was thinking of it that way. And, and that the whole telekinesis part kind of threw me, you know, with that theory, but I, I just thought to myself, wouldn't it be great if these guys aren't super powered? They just, just Will the circumstances themselves. of this movie, you know. But I think that that's, I mean, and that's when you get into glass, that is what exactly what the, uh, the therapist is trying to instill in them exactly, is that yes. this is all, it's a sickness. You guys are sick. I've been going across the country. And of course, now we're jumping movies because there's no way you can talk about one without the other. Uh, go back a little bit to Unbreakable. We don't have to dwell on Unbreakable too long. You, you talk about the, the whole, the, the panning of the camera, the back and forth. It's it, it shot very voyeuristically. When we first meet David, he's on the train. And he comes across as a bit of a douchebag. You see him trying to take off his right, ring and he's yeah. hitting on a girl right next to him. Obviously, you find out later he's got issues with his wife. Uh, and that's part of the reason why he's looking to go to New York because they're splitting up and it's that little girl that it's from her point of view sitting in the seat in front of him watching this ad transaction but there's a couple of, to me that's very comic booky you know because when you have long talkie scenes in a comic book you can't just sustain two talking heads yeah it's got to be panel to panel right right so you got this panel to panel it's not to the point where like ang lee was shooting the hulk where he was literally jumping from from panel to panel as a comic book would uh, there's a scene where David and his wife are trying to kind of reconvene a little bit. And after he survives the train crash and she's like, you know, this had to happen for a reason. Maybe we need to give ourselves a second chance. So they go on a date and you just see them. They're just sitting at the table in a restaurant and it's just this long, it's a, it's a pullback shot and it's probably a, a, a four or five minute shot. And it's just, it's just a slow pan in where by the end of it, you got one talking head and then another talking head kind of a thing. So little things like that I love about this movie because it, he does kind of pick up on some of that comic book you feel, whether it's banged over your head or not. It just, even David Dunn, you know, the alliteration of Reed Richards and Peter Parker, David Dunn, you know, so he's, he's laying the groundwork, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't have a cape per se, but he's wearing the security poncho. Right. Yes. Yeah. Which carries through. So that is, is his great. costume, really. Right. And the and he scene. wears it throughout, and he wears it in glass. So you, yes, yeah. maybe this without that, because that's a it's a rain poncho protecting him against water. Yeah, yeah. And what's great is that uh, Shyamalan went to the extent of creating color schemes for each of these characters, and it carries through in glass. It carries through in their counterpart characters. So we do see his son Joseph, who's now grown up nineteen years later. He's wearing green which is what his dad, the green poncho that his dad wears. 
Uh, Elijah's got the purple thing going on. So even when he's not wearing his jacket, he's got a purple towel around his legs when he's in a wheelchair. The Horde are like this yellow mustard kind of a thing going on. And you see Casey wearing those same colors at the end of glass. So he's got this color thing going throughout, which was subtle or not subtle. I don't know. Probably not so subtle. Um, and, and speaking of colors, let me tell you, the kid that played Joseph like, as a kid and then as an adult in Glass has the most bizarre eyes I have ever yeah. seen on, a, on an actor. It looks like whenever you see him, remember those X-Files episodes where the black goo would cover like the, the iris? <laughs> yes, yes, he's, yeah, he's got very bu- big uh, like, you know, It was like an, almost like an X-Files tie-in to me, like he's right. taken over by the black oil, yeah. Yep. But yeah, but you go back to that stadium scene and I still even and I've seen this movie numbers of times when he finally gives in and he says, all right, I'm going to do this. This is because Elijah is like, you got to go. You've had flashes. You got to test yourself. Yeah, you got to test yourself. You got to go to a place. Now, he, he was a security guard in a stadium. So he goes and he literally is just standing there and you just get this back shot with his hands coming out fan wise and he's just brushing people as they go by and he's getting these visions. He's getting these visions and I still get chills. I still get chills watching that scene. And it, this movie tickles me to no end. And obviously the, the end is not really, I guess it's a twist ending. Is it more of a reveal? I guess at this point. Yeah, really, no, it's, I would consider it a twist. Right. Like, that you find it, out it, that it's basically Elijah. it's Elijah. Yeah. Who, he's been controlling this whole s- scenario. Yeah. Yeah. Actually destroying trains and blowing up buildings and planes in an effort to find to look for that guy yeah to look this guy for hero yeah yeah so, so but it made me think the you know very, of course very similar to the dead zone david could only see bad things like he could never see trivial things like you never see he doesn't brush against anybody oh they're gonna have a uh, roast beef for dinner tonight right, right. <laughs> <laughs> now that would be a superpower at lunch you're gonna treat yourself to a vanilla ice cream <laughs> You're gonna eat it too fast. You're gonna get an ice cream headache. It's gonna hurt real bad. <laughs> so, and of so, course, yeah, so this, this is the this is the uh, M Knight's also cameo in Unbreakable. Yeah, see, he. he uh, I will say he plays the same character. He in does, Alfred. which is which is cool. He he, he plays, plays the same he character. Plays all the three. same character. But I think it's distracting. You know. Well, that's always been. I mean, fine. You know, if you want to do Hitchcock, cameo, you know, did it, but he always Albert did it as like. Did, but he never had a speaking role. You know, he just kind of yeah. was walk was, on, walk off. Right. So, but giving yourself a speaker, it, it's always distracting to me. You know, yeah. like oh, here's the M Night part, and and nobody is looking forward to it. I challenge anybody that's looking forward to these cameos. <laughs> well, I will, like I will say, Stan Lee, you know, his cameo, his cameo in uh, Signs is integral to the plot. Which is a case of ego, I think. <laughs> let me be. Let me be this character. You I know? will say when when the credits for uh, Glass uh, rolled at the beginning, I was happy to see that he wrote he he wrote and directed this. So his vision, yeah. he's kept his vision from beginning to end. Uh, whether it got sidetracked, you know, where he had to kind of make split on its own and throw David into the end. Now a lot of people didn't even know that. Like he he made that with. He didn't like a, include that in the test screenings. That scene was not in there for The split. studio didn't even know he was doing that. And as soon as they saw it, they were like, dude, you can't do that. Because <laughs> Universal, Universal owned Split. They released Split. And, and Disney but it was Buena Unbreakable, Vista. Right? It was Buena Vista who released Unbreakable. And they're like, that's a different studio's character. Yeah. Well, they made it work. They made it work. And only, I think, because Split uh, ended up making uh no i think i think unbreakable did okay in this in the box office but it wasn't like a gangbusters right you know it didn't it did make its money back it wasn't a flop by any means from what i understand right. um i think but, you know but, after but after the sixth, sixth sense, sense it was a disappointment yeah, yeah. yeah. So before we leave unbreakable uh just let's talk about how bat ish crazy elijah's theories are and it turns out that they're kind of true in the end. But he really reaches, especially with the whole water being your weakness thing, because he's really wants this to be true. Elijah does. That David Dunn is a superhero. That this right. is the opposite number that he's been looking for all his life. And so he explains away anything that David has to say that would refute this theory. Um, one being that he's he almost drowned as a child. Right, as a kid. Yep. So he comes up with off the cuff that that means that water is your weakness. Right. And this kind of 
I would never drink again. Yeah. So, but this kind of fed into my theory that, that Elijah is feeding all this to David. And so he thinks that he's super powered. He thinks that water is his weakness. So that's where the brilliance of Unbreakable was to me. The kind of little, it was negated a little bit in the, in the following two movies is that Elijah could be feeding him all this and enabling him to be a super powered person with right. water as a weakness. You know, how could this be true? He's just coming off with this stuff from the, from the top of his head. And David's kind of buying into it. it, but eating it up at the yeah, same time. Yeah, he's buying into it. And then those two kids, when he was in the pool, he fell into the pool. And you're like, oh, here we go. And then uh, the two kids who we had saved earlier save him. So. Yeah, and I was un <laughs> uncertain whether the mother was alive or dead. I got the impression that she was dead. I think yeah. actually in the following scene, when he's sitting at the dinner table, the breakfast table, and uh, Joseph comes in, he sits down, and he just casually pushes the newspaper across, and it shows like a little un unseen hero saves two. So right. I think that they're implying that the two kids, uh, you know, were the only survivors. The mind. Right. You get the, the the little. He just looks at his son and he says, "You're right." He's whispering, "You were right." And the kid starts crying, and I'm like, "That is so powerful." And I, <laughs> yep the the ultimate don't tell mom moment. <laughs> yeah, basically, mom, you were right. Yeah, <laughs> don't tell me. Don't Father tell and mom. son bonding at its best. Yeah, and that's great. And I love the fact that they brought this actor back, Spencer Treat Collar. Yeah. Yeah. For, has he been in anything else i so, i'm gonna say no <laughs> if i go to imdb right now there's probably two movies right, right. no I, th that, I take that back no i think he has been in something now i gotta look it up but so, uh, so what what kind of buckets would we give unbreakable i'm thinking you can rate this very high i can't i can't go five. Oh man I, I, I gotta go at least a uh, four seven five okay this movie's really high up there for me and it holds up. It holds up for me. I can watch it numerous times. It is my favorite. Of the M. Night Shyamalan, yeah. Shyamalan movies, yeah. Yep. You see, I still have issues with its pace. You know, I appreciate it for what it is, but it's not my favorite of the trilogy, I'd have to say. So I would give it three and a half. Okay, okay. that's fair. It's, it's you know, I think we, we, we had this discussion this morning before we started recording that all of his movies are very uh, divisive. Yeah. You either yeah. kind of buy into this universe that he's creating or you're like, this is just hogwash. And I think we'll get into that a little bit more when we get the glass. Definitely. Yeah. But let's move on. Yeah. Before that, let's move on to Split. Split. This movie is just... Now, I completely dismissed this movie. By, by the time this movie came out, M. Night had just lost any luster for me. He just had a, a string of ugly movies that... He got caught up in the whole super reveal at the end that, you know, twist for sake of a twist, the village, Lady in the Lake, Air, The Last Airbender. How do you screw that movie up? But <laughs> even my son at the time, I think he, we were half an hour into it and he goes, this is bad. And he was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> now, we were fans of the, of the, of the animated show. So, so I just so you would go as far as to say that Signs maybe was his last hurrah until I I absolutely yeah absolutely which is Signs is up there Signs is in the how about movie. the village what were your feelings on I like the village I thought it was interesting but again you get to the you get to the end and it's like this twist for sake of a twist and yeah. somehow the twist doesn't always hold together it was kind of like well, logistically logically it didn't really make sense that they were able to somehow maintain that village uh, in the yeah, here. It's and one of those that's entertaining if you don't think too much about it. Right. Yeah. Not a and, bad You movie. know, Joaquin Phoenix is great in it. Yeah, you know, um, Bryce Howard. So, I mean, there, there's some good performances or whatever. Yeah. There's some, some great moments with the creature. And so fast forward to Split, and he is back on his game with this movie. I loved Split when I first saw it from the get-go. It's, um, it's a very tense horror kind of setup with a, a maniac kidnapping three teenage girls. You don't really know what the situation is. Yeah, that didn't so really... You realize that he's got Split personality. DID, yeah. as they call it. DID, which is, I guess, I guess, you know, we can't refer to it as multiple personality disorder anymore. It is disassociative identity disorder. Identity yeah. disorder, yes. Yeah. I had no interest in this movie whatsoever, and I stayed away from it until I heard about the twist ending, about about the the tie into Unbreakable. So then I had to go, and I it was I think it was on HBO, and I caught a few minutes of it, and I sat there the credits just to see that whole David Dunn tie in, 
but it wasn't until we, Glass was re- revealed that Glass was coming out that I went back and, and watched this movie. And McAvoy is unfreaking believable in this he is. Movie. And the fact that he wasn't originally the first choice for this role, he was not. Phoenix was going to do it. Joaquin Phoenix. Was he too busy doing his Joker movie? I don't know. I, I don't know the story of why he didn't do it, but mm. I'm glad he didn't because I can't see him doing the stuff that McAvoy Well, that's did. interesting because he's been associated with uh, Shyamalan. He was in Signs. Oh, he yeah, was that's probably there. why. He was, yeah. he was thinking of him for the, for the part. Interesting. I, I don't see any other actor. And even then, even if you told me that McAvoy, like, I didn't really think he had the chops to pull this off, but you go back and you watch some of those movies that he's in and he's very versatile. He is just a, a crazy committed actor. I mean, he this, is, this I mean, this movie, he takes it to the next level. He does. And it's grounded in reality as well, um, which you can't really say about glass, but this is really base level stuff. And it's from the perspective of the kidnappees, the kidnappees, victims. Yeah. Uh, you see these three teenage girls coming out, coming back from a restaurant birthday party and their dad is collecting all their leftovers and he's putting them in the trunk of their car and the three girls are in the car already and suddenly a stranger gets in the driver's seat. Dad's nowhere to be found. Yeah. And it is James McAvoy as Kevin Wendell Crumb or Dennis probably. It was Dennis, yeah. I think it was Dennis in the at the time. What do you have, 23, 23 yeah, altogether? Yeah, 23 different personalities. And some, different of which, personalities. some of which called the Horde, which worship an entity known as the Beast, which was an unforeseen personality that was about to emerge from Kevin yes. Randall Crump. Now, he was also tied in. He was, he was seeing psychiatric help. Yes, he was. From Betty was a, Buckley. Betty Eight Buckley. is enough. That's, oh, know. is that who that was? I, thought, yeah. I, I, I just thought that maybe... Um, they couldn't afford Dame Judy Dench. So like, Let's get someone who kind of looks like her. But she had some gravitas, man. She really, Dr. Fletcher, right? That was her yeah. name, Dr. Fletcher. Name. And he would show up. She would get these mystery emails. And so it was always kind of like this, this game of trying to decide who it was that was in charge and what personality she was actually speaking to. But he just, I mean, you know, we use this tour de force description with uh, Sam Rockwell in moon and that's all you can say about it it's a tour de force performance i mean he is flawlessly going from character to character personality i guess not character yeah um physically changing his body i mean not just the clothing but i mean his personality his mannerism um you know he had one patricia miss patricia I uh, just, I, I, you can't say enough about this movie, uh, especially his performance is just mind boggling. Yeah. And like the, like the best horror movies, again, it's from the perspective of the kidnapped victims. So you have Anya Taylor Joy, who's playing Casey, who's the main girl here of the three kidnappees. And it turns out that she's also, she also has many issues. Yeah, she was a little bit of an outcast. She was yeah. so the two girls at the beginning are like kind of like clicky best friends, upper elite, and she's just maybe somebody who accidentally got an invite, and the dad offers to give her a ride home because no one shows up to get her. Right, and, and through you flashbacks, can, you, after they get kidnapped, through flashbacks, you find out that she not only has uh, like survivalist skills a little bit at least, right. but her father had died, and she was taken in by an uncle who abused her, and it was yeah. in the course of abusing her during the during this movie. While we go through the plot, it's kind of revealed that Kevin Crumb as the Beast eventually identifies with Casey, so she survives. Well, I think she identifies with him. Yeah. Too. Now, wait, what plot? Because there really is no plot in this movie. <laughs> well, this is the great thing about Split, is because you're seeing it from their perspective. You don't know where you are. Just like them, you're stuck in this room. All you can see is the character of Barry, who's actually Dennis pretending to be Barry, which is just mind-boggling to me how you would play that. Right the character going back and forth to his psychiatrist. So she thinks nothing is wrong and you don't know where he's coming from or where this underground layer is that he's holding. Right. Girl. Yeah. So you're right. in the same spot that they are like, where yeah. are No. Yeah. You're just not, you're just not, you know, as the, as the, uh, the victims, you're not privy to his conversations with right. Dr. Dr. Fletcher. Yeah. Casey's a fascinating character because she identifies with him. And, and I mean, you almost got to the point where you're like, is she going to have like multiple, you know, 
we're going to get through this and then she's going to like team up with him a Harley yeah. Quinn slash Joker kind of right. a thing. But you find now Beast is coming. To, and let's talk about Hedwig, who is by far the most interesting of his personalities. Yeah. My name's Hedwig. I have red socks. He's on the move. And I think he was cha- McAvoy was channeling a little bit of Edith Bunker with Hedwig. <laughs> I never thought of that. Hedwig, well, he's got oh, a list, watchy. and he's a little, he's a nine, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, he's got a little bit of a lisp, and he's a nine-year-old boy, and all oh, they're coming for you. The beast is coming for you. Yep. yep. He's coming. <laughs> and he's just such a... And like, he's so again, giddy and excited about and it. Just, and he just changes physically. And, now, and obviously, when he becomes the beast, he is just a ripped monster. Um, and I was convinced that this was somehow CG'd or augmented, but he really kind of went out no, of his but way you to see him kind of ripped when he's like in Patricia's turtlenecks as well. And yeah. it makes me think, you know, this guy just spends twenty four hours being crazy. When do you have time to go to the gym? Right. <laughs> Because he sure don't got a membership. Yeah, no. Oh my god! But we, but so he ends up in a rage, killing Doctor Fletcher. Uh, but before she's killed, she scribbles on a piece of paper, which Casey ends up finding and using, which is "Say his name, Kevin Wendell Crumb," and it's the Rumpelstiltskin Mister Mixelplex uh, <laughs> syndrome, right? It is. It totally yeah. is. You get you get the bad guy to say his name three times, and somehow he's he's you know he just shuts down. So I'm like, this is how we're gonna get rid of him in in glass. All you gotta do is say his name. Casey's right. gonna show up, say his name three times, and he's just gonna you know become that character. Again. But you know what's funny to me is how they kind of really sidelined the original personality of Kevin Wendell Crumb. He only well, Kevin. Well, out. that's the thing, which so is Kevin, it's completely. So they keep talking. This is an interesting uh, thing, which is that these characters. Uh, for lack of a better term, are sitting in a room all waiting for their turn in the light. Yeah, they, they want and, the mic. They want the they want Hedwig, for lack of a better term, is the MC. Yep. And he, you know, he, you know, by and large, does what the others, you know, especially the Horde, uh, tell him to do. But uh, yeah, and by the time you get in the glass, you see that they're all fighting for dominance. They're all fighting to take that light. Um, but Casey's able to bring uh, Kevin the original personality out and you find that, you know, his, his abusive mother uh, kind of forced these kind of forced pers- these, these personalities. Them. And that's what DID is. I actually did a little bit of research and, and most of this comes from traumatic experiences uh, in your life, whether, whether it's a, a natural disaster or if it's if being abused uh, or, or a traumatic event that, that somehow splinters your mind and forces these personalities because you you don't have any other way to deal with the trauma. And not only was it his mother that brought this about through her abuse, but also there's a story related here because he is a a zoo worker, apparently at the Philadelphia zoo. And that's where he was keeping the girls in the. Right. And there is an incident where two teenage girls as a prank, get him to touch their breasts. Yeah. Now, this prank never existed when I was in high school. <laughs> you know, I would have loved to have been, please, oh, you know, play Lord. a prank on me. Yeah, prank no. please, prank <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that would not fly in today's day. No, day. no. Uh, and yeah. apparently, um, this movie had its own controversy when it was released because it cast a negative light on uh, DID patients. So a few doctors spoke out about it, saying it was it, it stigmatized DID patients as you know insane and dangerous, and a few patients also spoke out about it, but they couldn't really be trustworthy because in one second they'd like <laughs> you it. Didn't know which second. personality they're actually. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking our confessional might be a little <laughs> making light of it as well. Um, it's. Yeah, it's 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 a different movie than Unbreakable by 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 far. Uh, it, he shoots it completely differently. Even when we were when the Beast is revealed, like he's mostly in shadow. You don't really see McAvoy like full on in Beast mode. Uh, although he he's got the ability to climb walls, um, bend steel. So uh, it's 
it's a crazy ass flick. It, it really is. is. It is. But you know what? What makes this movie is the tie-in at the very end. Right. But let's let's also talk briefly about the beast's motivation. So he wants to eat people that are impure. No, impure. The, do, do yeah, I have the, this right? Un, uh, yeah, he, the un. Oh, man. So if if you have never had trauma in your life, you are impure. But if you have had trauma in your life, then you are pure. Your heart is pure. Rejoice! The broken are the more evolved. Then you're good. So he needs to eat the impure. And he's looking for somebody, that perfect person, which is, ties into maybe what you thinking that Casey and Kevin Crumb would have joined forces at the end because they see simpatico in each other yeah she definitely had uh i think a little bit of the stockholm syndrome that she she related to him where the other two girls you know to the point where he separated them and they were just like they just they just needed to get out they weren't willing to invest in his character like she got down and talked with hedwig spoke with him like a person so i think that that really kind of cemented him in trusting her a little bit um but yeah the beasts was this the first time that he had eaten somebody or was going to eat somebody? You don't really know if he was, if he's done this before. It, it made it sound like the beast had never emerged until this, the event. And he was an amalgam of like animals, supposedly from the zoo. Yes. Is that the, the, right? That was this, right. this whole idea of this, this beast was like. Yeah, and still, even by the end of it, you realize they're underneath the zoo, but like how he commandeered all that space is also kind of a mystery. Was, did, did he have his own place besides that where he lived or he just lived under the zoo? That was his home. I don't, right, that was right. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. But it's a good movie. It's, it's it like it. And, is, yeah. So we'll, we'll tie this in right now, which is I said at the beginning that Shyamalan had every intention of introducing this character in Unbreakable. And he just, he couldn't make it happen. So any reference to Kevin Wendell Crumb was um, stricken. But there's a scene in the stadium when David Dunn is standing there. This is Unbreakable, the first movie. And as he's holding his hands out, a mother and a son pass by him and he gets a quick flash and he actually turns around and looks at them and then keeps on going. That was Kevin and his mother. Oh, okay. So, but again, this is 19 years later. So, I mean, McAvoy looks like he's well into his late 30s. <laughs> that would have put him like, what, 20? Yeah, that would have put him at the same age his son was in Glass. Yeah, basically. Glass. So, yeah. there's, I think even at the end of this one, David Dunn makes some mention that there's been 15 years since Elijah was put away. But that doesn't necessarily. So, was his son? When we get into glass, was this kid in high school still? He seemed to be in that one scene where they were in like a high school basketball. gym, like a, like a big right. brother type guy. Is that what it was? Uh, okay, because I'm like, there's no way that this kid's still in high school. Yeah, <laughs> no, like, I don't think he just, was. I think I'll, I'll like believe a, a man can climb a wall, but I can't believe that kid. Like still it, it makes sense. Like you know, he's a, trying to be a do-gooder in his own way. You know, without the superpowers of his dad. Right. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. All right. Big brother. Big yeah. Yeah, I buy that. So yeah, so so this is canon because if you again, if you go to the IMDb, there's an interview with Shyamalan, and he brings up point blank that this character has always been part of this universe. Uh, he had every intention of introducing him in Unbreakable, and it just got to the point where it didn't it didn't flow, it didn't work, and he cut him. But that little scene still sits in there, and that was intended to be Kevin Wendell Crumb. Okay. Okay. So, there we have it. And then we get in the glass, you'll see that there's an even bigger tie. But before we do, let's go to the concession stand oh, like we always do, right? Man. Some popcorn. We're happy to have you with us this evening and want you to enjoy every minute of your stay here. And while you relax and stretch, visit our concession where you'll find something to please you. There are ice cold drinks, delicious sandwiches, ice cream, coffee and snacks, and many other pleasing treats. Our foods are fresh and tasty. Our drinks satisfying and refreshing. They're so good. You get more out of life when you go out to a movie. Did you have some uh, fruit punch, high C? Some high C with some hints of soda from the other from the other fountain drinks. <laughs> the <laughs> other fountains that are all tied in together. Yeah, there. exactly. Yeah, my girl. I had a new girl at the the popcorn uh, the other day, and they asked for the extra butter and. 
you got to do it in layers. Come on, people. Yeah. No, no. It's just piled. just on the top. I, just on the top. She did. Just on the top. Just on the top. Glass. glass. Let's let's talk glass. So, like I said, if if this movie made people go back and watch Unbreakable, then mission accomplished. <laughs> it fits right into Shyamalan's. It does. Wheel of Bell. It does. Um, it starts I, off really strong for me. It really did. The beginning was David Dunn is set up in his own security uh, yep. store, right? And yep. him and his son kind of use this as a headquarters where they seek out bad guys. And he kind of, it's like his back cave almost. Yeah, like, yeah, back, basically. Right? Yeah. Yep. And I was, like I said, you know, thrilled to see this kid reprising his role. Yeah. 19 years later. Yeah. And he's got the same poncho from Unbreakable, right? That's Yeah, you would think that this, I hope he had a couple of them because that's got to be, how do you wash that? <laughs> you know, so he's, he's recording, he's, he's surveilling the kid. Who, he's kind of like his Robin. You know, he's, he's, he's on the computer, he's on the phone, he's on the internet, he's, he's checking out dad, they're, they're aggressively looking for you. They finally settled on a name for him, like 20 years later, they're now calling him the overseer, which I thought was kind of cool. And he says, it's better than tippy toe man. And he goes, <laughs> don't ever mention tippy toe man again. And I'm like, that's pretty funny. <laughs> And the wife is now obviously out of the picture. So there's no. Yeah, which I was, I was kind of sad to see that play out but yeah so you never knew if she left maybe because he was a superhero or if she never knew well, about he, a secret or what he got that little flash where he goes into the apartment and obviously it's not the house they lived in and he initially. said that he had something to tell her right and he and he sees her he gets this the little memory flash where he sees her at the stove so i got the impression that she stuck with him whether or not she was ever privy to his going ons or if they really were able to kind of keep this on the down low and she didn't know but so yeah. in the beginning, you find that they are really hot on the heels of the horde. How's that for some alliteration? Huh? Hot on the heel of the <laughs> hordes. Oh, my. It, it picks up really right from the, the end scene of Split, where he Split. finds out on the news that this horde exists. And yep. so he so and now he's are yeah, looking for this them. Is, this, yeah. is, this is this guy. This is, maybe this is his true purpose. This is who he needs to be aggressively uh, pursuing because we know the public knows about the horde because casey survived split so she's yeah. told the authorities what they're dealing with here and so everybody's looking for kevin wendell crumb but um also we have david dunn looking for him as well and yeah. they've kind of by process of elimination figured out where he should be looking for him in um and this he has he has a new group of kids cheerleaders that he's cheerleaders, yeah. now uh, abducted how he's able to pull that off, I have no idea. There was four, four cheerleaders. Yep. That's a lot of people. All in their cheerleading outfit. So it must have been during or after a game of some sort. Right, sport. yeah. <laughs> or just some crazy sorority event going awry. Yeah. I don't know. But long story short, David finds him. And uh, by brushing against Hedwig at one point. Yep. It's funny because Hedwig... Whenever you see him in Split and in Glass, he's just so happy to have the light. Like that everybody is counting yeah. on him to give them access to the light. So he's just an over-the-top character, just like a kid would be if he had the world's attention, you know? Yeah. So he bumps into Hedwig, who's like, sorry, man, you know, as he's walking by him and he's yep. skipping down the, down the street. So David finds this highly suspicious. Uh, as is the fact that he sees a vision of these four dead cheerleaders. Right, with, uh, <laughs> right. That's not right. <laughs> That's not right. Maybe I should follow this guy. So he he does happen upon the specific factory that Kevin the Horde are are Hiding lodged out. up in. Yeah. He frees the cheerleaders and has an epic battle early on with the beast. Yes, the we see the beast in full on beast mode. Yeah. And and arguably, I think this battle is better than the the finale. The, this this initial battle yeah, between yeah. between them, yeah. uh, they go out the window as everybody sees in the trailer, and that's where they're captured by Doctor Ellie Staple. She's got a SWAT team of guys out there. How did she know they were there? Exactly. Yeah, she's, and she's waiting said, for them. So so you do find out at the end what her real purpose is, right? But <gasps> there's a twist ending. What? Yeah. Yeah, and Night Shyamalan has a twist ending. <laughs> but she's the yeah, entire I, movie trying to dissuade them of their superpowered abilities. That they're like we were saying before, they're not actually superpowered. It's all in their mind that they're nuts. But, but I, I find it funny myself, that you actually you buy into what she yeah. was. What she but then was again, doing. you're thinking to yourself: you saw them fall out the window, 
And I mean, this guy, uh, but she was able to, so, right. So they get put in an Institute and of course, Joseph's like freaking out his dad, his mom's dead. And now this, his dad's locked up. He's helped his dad put himself in this position. And now he's locked up in this loony bin and they're throwing a book at him. They're like, he's like, I've been helping people. No, you've hurt people. You, they need to have due process. There's like, you know, we got to go through this. You can't be a vigilante. Bernie gets 40 years ago, gunning down people in the subway. And now this guy in a, in a you know, a security uh, poncho. And the, the, the great thing about this setup is, is that the, Dr. Staple is aware of their weaknesses. So they've got a vat of water outside David's room to keep him under control. Yeah, with like a, like a hundred hoses, you know, fire exactly. hoses, like a, like all ready to just douse him, which and I thought they, was interesting. And they've got strobe lights in Kevin's room. But how do we know the strobe lights affected him? Yeah, that's a good question. Just because he refers to each personality as having Coming. the light. Oh, interesting. Is, so, like, but, forcing but the light, forcing they weren't very smart. None of his personalities were very smart because all you had to do is back up to the door and you wouldn't <laughs> see the light. <laughs> this is true. Right? He, is every, true. At every given moment, he's rushing the door, face headlight right into the headlight. But he yeah. did try to, so there's two orderlies that he's messing with, Pierce and Daryl. And I think that they're the only two orderlies that worked in this entire facility. Yeah, the, the only two employees, period, in this entire facility. And they weren't very, they, they were very inept. Um, now, did you get the warning before your showing about the flashing lights and how it might trigger an epileptic? No, but I saw a sign at the uh, ticket booth for Spider-Man. And now this is the second movie. If you're, I, did not, I did not get that warning at all. Epileptic. This is like a new trend. They're trying to take us out. All the epileptic... <laughs> So, no, we, so we've got that. yeah. So we've got the two we characters digress. who are are held by their weaknesses. That, you know, go back to to his acting prowess that that he's able to on a dime, on a dime. You can pull, pull another and, one out. And yeah, fighting with each other to 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 get to the light. They're they're now right because they're now in a, in a strange environment. He knows that he's. I mean, they they still make reference to oh, you're in trouble once the beast comes, mm-hmm. but. You know, they're kind of screwed. You can't mess um, with the beast. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then we realize that this is where Elijah is. This is where Elijah is, yeah. For the last 19 years. And I will say Sam Jackson rode this paycheck all the way to the bank because he didn't even have a stitch of dialogue for the first hour. No. He no, just he sat didn't. in his chair twitching in his eye. <laughs> right? Yes, he did. Because I was going into this because not only the, the stuff that I read about McAvoy's performance do is over the top, but a lot of stuff I read was praising uh, Sam Jackson's performance. And I'm watching, I'm waiting for him not to do He's this. not performing. No. <laughs> He's thinking about his next paycheck. He goes, I wonder what we're going to do with Nick Fury next. Right, right. But of course, you know, this, he's just, you know, he's just playing all these, these two attendants. He's getting out of his room. He's, he's playing possum. And so he's been setting up the hospital for his escape eventually, once he realizes who he's in with, that the beast could be an ally. And yeah, and they, and so this is, so Dr. Staples got, she says she has three days to, to convince them that they're all delusional. Three days? <laughs> Like that's just that. What does she got? Does she have to let him out after three days? I don't I know. Right there was no, right there wasn't there was no explanation. I guess maybe she had to move on. I, it doesn't make any sense. But then she puts him in a room together. Now David was was chained down. Why why was Kevin not chained down as well? Obviously Elijah was in a catatonic state in his wheelchair. He's right. not going anywhere. Well, they did have the lights behind her for Kevin. <sighs> Put him in chains. I don't care. Right. <laughs> We already saw that if you just put someone in front of the lights, he has a chance. If you just block the lights, give the guy sunglasses, he's out of there. So yeah. that, but, but again, that goes back into the color schemes I was talking about, which is very apparent when they're in that room. That they, It's a very kind of reddish, pinkish room. Uh, and it's weird because it's like the colors are very vibrant. And then as she goes on and she starts deconstructing each one of them, and she starts telling them that this is all in your head. Like the colors become muted, and I don't know if I, I'm I'm assuming that that was intentional, but it's like it's almost like they're losing their will to be superheroes, or they're right. they're questioning who and what they are. And she had a valid argument for every one of them, 
it's almost like it, it reminded me of Spider-Man 2, where Tobey Maguire ran into trouble because he was losing faith in his own losing abilities. Faith, yeah. And so literally, he began to lose his powers. Lose yeah. his power, yeah. You've got to so believe that, in order yeah. to have the powers. Right? I mean, I will say this, this movie, I mean, it borders on absurd at times. There's some definite leaps of logic, especially Elijah coming and going in his room. And they think him, he's giving him the medications. Meanwhile, he's swapped out, playing fast and loose with these, these two orderlies. Yeah. Um, and you don't you don't really see how he gets out of his No, room. correct. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, you just got to, you know, you you have to make that leap. Okay, he's a super genius. He's, you know, this is easy for him. Whatever. Yeah, and his mother and his mother who who was the original uh actor who played his mother in the first movie comes back. Who looks about as old as Sam Jackson. I think but... she's younger. She's actually <laughs> younger than Sam Jackson I read. He's 70 years old. He is. He's 70. That's crazy. Well, yeah. they did some work on him for Captain Marvel, some CGI Oh, that's stuff. all CG, dude. If you watch behind the scenes, he's he's filming with these dots with, on his face. With the dots on his head, wow. They're CG, they're CG in the, a younger version of his face. Mm. That's crazy. You can't even believe what you see anymore. In Kevin's cell, at one point, you see like a little uh, shelf, and he had like 23 toothbrushes. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't notice so that. So each personality had their own toothbrush. Really? I'm like, well, that was nice of them. Oh, do they are they labeled so that was uh yeah so again it's and there's one scene you know, that, go going ahead. along that path there's one scene where kevin comes out or maybe dennis i forget which one it is where he's um he breaks into tears and then hedwig comes out oh and he goes are you crying what, what are you, quiet what right you? <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh i will say so you see you see Elijah convinces Kevin, the horde, that he's going to get them free. And we're escaping. We're escaping. Yes. That sounds like the bad guy is teaming up. And that's exactly what he does. Yep. And then he goads David into, don't listen to what she says. You know, he's on a, he's talking into David in his room from the control room. Basically, so there's no one else in this, in this building whatsoever. There's two orderlies. There's a security <laughs> guard, but he's outside for whatever reason. It gets explained away. I mean, he's got it right down to the minute this guy comes in. He's late for work. You know, his car backfires. I know exactly where he is. He likes to talk. So, so I got one minute left before I get to go back. You know, and we're told early on that there's 100 plus video cameras set up throughout this building watching your every move. And yet he can come and go whenever he wants. <laughs> and no one's any the wiser. Right. Um, but uh, unless he wants them to see him. Correct. Right. And, and that's the big, at the end, you see that he has been controlling this from the beginning and he is the genius that we all thought he was in the first one. So, yeah. So Elijah is trying to tell David to escape as well to stop them from their nefarious plan of. Yeah, exploding. because the goal is to go to this, there's, there's this Tower, stuff, right? which is what Nagatomi, uh, was it Naga, Nagatomi Tower in Die Hard? I mean, that's all. Yeah, that would have been. Like, is this like a little diehard shout out? Are we going to have a battle? But there was a Marvel shout out too. Did you see the cover of the Marvel and and DC on the cover of that magazine? Yep. In the fonts, in the in the the Marvel font. The little the little yep. Yeah. So that was interesting. So they escape, and he finds he goes into the the prisoner personal uh, items uh, room, and he gets his old purple you know, purple it's, rain, it's uh, purple rain. Yeah. Yeah. Jacket. But yeah. he's got an MG gold encrusted, uh, little tie. I thought it was MC. No, it's MG, Mr. Glass. Mr. Glass. Oh, I was but trying to never, what the, but where did he get that MC? from? He's been was, locked up since the first movie. Right. And that was like a, in the first movie, he's like, they called me Mr. Glass. Like it was, now he's embracing it. But back right. then it was like, he was like, oh, I'm Elijah. So all of a sudden he's got this MG and I'm just like, where the hell did he get that? You order it on Amazon. <laughs> There's a big battle in the in the parking lot, and I just I found myself with a chest grin on my face watching this unfold because you have Casey. Casey's come back in, which I was very happy to see this character come back. But immediately they let her in the room with Kevin, and she's like touching him and talking with him. And, and you know the doctor's like, "You can get through to him. I think we need you." And she's like, "Screw that." But I'm like, there's no way in hell you would let right. a, a right. victim of this guy back into it. Like that security in this place. Was but, but let's just, talk about this. The reason you find out that the doctor possibly is not really a doctor. 
She is part of this, okay? Spoiler alert, if you're still with us after all yeah. this. This is the spoiler coming up. This is the twist. She is part of an Illuminati-type group that is protecting the world from these super beings. Uh, apparently, the world would just lose its dish if they knew that there were superheroes and supervillains. It's kind of like Men in Black. It's Men yeah. in Black going around hiding the fact that there are aliens. They're here to clean it up. So that's probably... That could be an explanation as to why there's only two employees in this hospital. It's not really a hospital. Maybe this group has just commandeered it to keep these three individuals locked up. Uh, yeah, be well, you know, that's a good that you that that makes sense with that you pointed that out because I think at the end when they're in the restaurant and then you find out you know two people leave the restaurant and she stands up and she's like, all right it's all of us and we're all in on it together the two orderly girls who who initially get thrown into the car by kevin when when he escapes out the parking lot are in that room so mm -hmm. yeah they must all be together and they all had like these little black the tattoo to or to uh, yeah the, the yeah the little the shamrock shamrock tattoos. yeah but it was only three leaves it wasn't four leaves exactly so. and the bartender even had it I'm like how do you get that gig yeah i'm a bartender <laughs> yeah, for I'm the a uh, bar illuminati. I'm a secret yeah. illuminati but i can make a <laughs> badass so so let's talk about so elijah's plan was to blow up this building which wasn't his plan at all it was the macguffin of the movie it sure he, was he had no intention of getting to that building all he wanted to do was get it to the parking lot where all these cameras could film the battle going on so yeah. he could spread that to the world. That's how the world would see them, not you know on the floor you know, blowing up the building with their own yeah. chemicals, as he was saying. That's how he got David out of his cell. But that's what he wanted. He wanted all three of them in the parking lot. He wanted lot them in the parking lot. So they could yeah. film it. For this whole thing to unfold. I will say that it, it is not the ending I expected or wanted, to be honest with you. I, I mean, would have liked to see them battle it out on top of that tower. That's what right, I well, that's <laughs> uh, Because, uh, shocker, all three of them are dead. <laughs> all three of them are dead. The Illuminati friggin' drowned David. Mr. Glass gets a living crap beat out of him by Kevin, and then Kevin gets shot. Kevin gets shot when he's Kevin. So when he's Kevin, so he's right. able to be shot, not as yeah. the beat. Right, because who who we know can repel bullets. Right. Yeah. At one point, you think like, the bad guys won. Did they, they got exactly what they? You know, not the bad guys. I guess it depends on how you look at it. That this Illuminati, the secret organization, did what they needed to do. They came in, they cleaned up, they got rid of these three people. Now we can move on somewhere else. Right. But then, of course, you get the message beaten over your head that Elijah has won, that he has outsmarted them because he's put this video out in the world. But really, how effective would this video? You see stuff like this photoshopped and oh, Facebook, I know. Yeah. Facebook yeah. all the time. You know, who would yeah. believe it if, I know. if it was out there for everybody to see? Because yeah. you so see you all have... these people in a train station, like looking at their phones, like, whoa, what? 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 Yeah. It wasn't that amazing. I, I make that same face when I see that video of the squirrel uh, water skiing. <laughs> <laughs> like, how did they get him to do Squirrels that? Can water ski, what? You know, I won't, I won't say Washington. something. There was a scene where Casey goes uh, to the comic book store, and it's the same comic book store that Elijah's yes. in in the first one. And yes. I think it's the same guy behind the counter, even. Um, now they've got Funko Pops. Did you notice that? Now they had a tall wall of Funko. I knew you were going to pick up yeah. on that. I got to go there. Um, <laughs> I was but, looking for the split Funko Pop, actually. That would have been cool. <laughs> that was a little meta. Yeah. A little David Dunn overseer. Yeah. That'd be cool. Um, and she starts talking to the guy behind the counter and she's asking questions about comic books. Now we get a banged over the head a little bit with, with Elijah's, uh, exposition on comic books. And I mean, back in 2000, like I said, the comic book revolution really wasn't here yet. So it was like, well, comic books, you know, now we're all embedded in comic book movies. So I think some of the tropes that he was like pushing was kind of like, obvious it was like yeah. yeah we know how comic books we know how bad guys work we know how you know the plot but anyways he brings up action comics number one as like the pinnacle of when comics became modern day american mythology and what struck me was the video that goes viral is kevin lifting up that cop car or flipping it over is very reminiscent of the first cover of Action Comics number yeah. one of Superman what? lifting yeah. the car. And I'm like, that 
if that's intentional, that's genius. So I don't know. It was just, you know, a little throwaway thing. But when they're the three of them, so you got you got um, Elijah's mom, who I know you know she had a name, Casey and Joseph. And they're all sitting in that, the train station and they all received the emails from Elijah with these videos. And now they're the ones who released it. Right. They're right. the ones who now. Right. And they're like, whoa, we released it three hours ago. And that's where those color schemes also carry through because all three of those characters are now wearing the colors of oh. their counterparts, the green, he's wearing all green. Mom's got purple on and Casey's got like this mustard color thing. And I'm like, are they, because like on his deathbed, Elijah said, this is an origin story. And I'm like, are they going to become superheroes now? Are they right. going to pick up the mantle? You know, if you believe you're, uh, you know, you follow what you said, which is if you believe that you're a superhero, then maybe you are regardless of what your true abilities are. But that didn't carry out other than the fact that they released this video. That speaks to us. I think we should go to the train station when this episode is about to air. And then when it drops, we just look at everybody's reaction to it. Like, whoa, (laughs) whoa. These guys are still recording. What the hell? I will tell you that I also thought in the end credits, McAvoy gets credit for all of his characters. Yeah. They don't just say, you know, Kevin Wendell Crumb. They give him credit for all of his of his characters. Um, if like, this that's... movie came out in December, I would be extremely disappointed if he didn't get some kind of awards recognition nomination for this. I think that he is just over the top, better than anybody. I I could put pit him against anybody that's nominated for an Oscar this year, and yeah. and probably yeah. argue that he, McAvoy does a better job. Yeah, and unfortunately, where it sits right now, a year from now, no one's going to remember it. No one's going to remember. It's going to overshadow. And because it's a quote-unquote genre film, it's Mm -hmm. not going to. So it's. I was happy with this. I was really happy with it. It, it, Again, it wasn't – maybe I was just – after 19 years, I was just, all right, it's coming to fruition. It is Elijah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not really his movie, even though it's called Glass. I mean, I guess it's it's all his machinations coming to fruition with this whole plot. So yeah, so I enjoyed it. I didn't hate it. You know, I didn't like it as much as Split. No, I think didn't like it as much as Unbreakable. Are... I'll tell you that. No, right. but um, but I think it was a very. F- I was disappointed that they didn't make it to the tower, but I think keeping the ending grounded <laughs> the way it was, yeah. was fitting. It would have been a little too fantastical. Yeah, maybe. Mm-hmm. So, so so what so we didn't give split buckets either. So what kind of what kind of ratings would we give split and glass? I would go four for split. I'm gonna have to go four on split. Yeah, just for his performance alone. Glass, I think, makes it halfway there. It's 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 a, it's a half it's a glass half filled. That's good. <laughs> that's very good. I would give glass three. I think I would give that. I three. would go three and a half. I go three and a half. I like I said, I I found myself with just a, a, a just grin on my face as I'm watching that little fight unfold. Because again, right, you kept waiting for the we're gonna go to the tower. How are yeah. you gonna get to the tower? There's helicopters everywhere. You, you're in a wheelchair. You're not gonna just run across like a dog like you did in the yard. So, but then when you realize this is it, this is the culmination right here. I was in for better or for worse. It is. It's yeah. That's his movie. He stuck with it. And no end credit, by the way. Don't say through the credits. Yeah, and I did. You know, now with we every all, movie. Well, I got to say, that, we're, right? we're, we're conditioned. Yeah. You have to, because you just never know. And you could pretend you're interested in where they filmed it, but, you know, you're <laughs> right. really just... Which was, which was interesting. Because, well, I was interested because there's a lot of New York stuff there. It's like the whole thing took place it's in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, right? Yeah. And yet there was some New York. Thank, we, we thank New York. Oh, okay. Yes. I mean, if you're a fan of Unbreakable... If you like Split, I, I say see this movie. If you enjoyed those two movies, you will like this. It might disappoint you on some levels, but it's, hey, it's, it's an entertaining afternoon out. So yeah. what more can you ask for? Two, two plus hours, so. So this leads right into our confessional this week. Confessionals. We kind of taking this theme of split personality, or not split personality, but um, DID. DID. If we could choose a personality, not necessarily from this movie, but if one that we could manufacture and have as our split personality, what would we go with? What kind of a person would it be? So, so do you have any, any solid thoughts on this, Jeff? Well, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough question to begin with. <laughs> it is. Um, but uh, according to my family, I already have multiple personalities. <laughs> 
um, we have at least five that reside in my brain. Uh, we have Mr. Mumbles, <laughs> who uh, likes to uh, talk incoherently. I have old man Craigie Pants Dale, who uh, likes to get his kid off his lawn. I got know-it-all Jeff uh, Jeopardy Jerk, which my kids don't like at all. Is this, is this um, the Jeff that shows up for this podcast? <laughs> every now and again, you know. <laughs> But then there's that super rare uh, fun father, Hefe. You know, he usually shows up around two and a half Roman Cokes. Okay. Um, and he's the guy I like, you know, minus the alcohol. But he's, uh, he's a fun guy. Um, you know, he's full of, uh, he's a master of inappropriate uh, body jokes and um, inappropriate moments. That's a guy I'd go with <laughs> on occasion. Okay. Okay. I really didn't have anything for this, to be honest <laughs> with you. I didn't want to make fun of the multiple personality disorder people. I can't choose. Right. Someone's listening to us right now. We see. So, well, I have the uh, the opposite problem. It's like I just have the same personality regardless of the situation I'm put in. So I would love to switch it up a little bit to to shut myself off and have somebody else take over. <laughs> if I'm so like presented like with a, stress like or something. Attrition? I would name my guy Kurgan. And it would Kurgan. be like, <laughs> like Kurgan Baker. And maybe he would just turn on in the morning before I go to work and he'd turn off when I'd come home. I'd show up the next morning. He would have fired five people. <laughs> <laughs> but never get fired himself? No, maybe he could take airplane trips for me. And, you know, instead oh, of... Oh, I like that. Airplane, maybe he, he'd be Kurgan. the guy that would make everybody nervous. What was that noise? You know? <laughs> Kurgan. So yeah, I would I would like to be a, a bit of a hard ass sometimes, which I am naturally not. It's 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 hard to go against your uh, grain. Yeah, it is. It's, it's you know at our age you you have to just say I am who I am, right. and you can't I I can't be bad guy dad. What a weak confessional that was. I apologize. That was, that was, listen, <laughs> <laughs> we've already hit the superhero. We've already. Yeah. <laughs> So, all right. Well, let's talk about next week's show. Now that you've survived this marathon. Yeah, we babbled on with this one. Huh? Uh, we're going, again, we're a little bit uh, late out of the gate here, but we are going back. I know most of you probably have seen this already, but hey, you haven't heard us talk about it. So come back next week. Bird Box. We, we are, are the, I believe we are the last three humans on the planet. <laughs> Who haven't spoken about Who it. haven't talked about Bird Box. I haven't even uh, seen it yet, so I'm waiting. You haven't seen it yet? No. no well, no. I will tell you, my kids beat me to the punch on this one. And I jumped on board before we even, I think, officially agreed to it. Because it's like, it was a two-week phenomenon where you could go anywhere without someone mentioning or talking about it or reading about some idiot who was taking the bird box challenge <laughs> and running into a tree with their car. <laughs> so we will get into the logistics of people life imitating art because how dumb are you? <laughs> Come on. This reminds me of the guy, those two guys at the beginning of glass with the Superman punch. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's basically. I what think it is. yeah. Anybody that's imitating Bird Box needs David Dunn to come after them. At, you know, in the middle of the night. There you go. You deserve to be taken out. Jeff, would you like to reveal our classic feature next? Well, one? I think that we're actually going to uh, stay on this Shyamalan uh, train ride for one more stop, and uh, we're going to follow up Bird Box with signs. And I believe that you will see some similarity. Some correlation to this? There will be some correlation. Now, if some we are obvious, watching I'm signs, if we are watching signs next week, I request respectfully that we also add one mini feature to our All slate of films week. Because I always thought signs had much in common with a little special that aired on the UPN network 1998. This is called Alien Abduction Incident in Lake County. This is pre Blair Witch. This is a um, like a found footage type special that, and it was presented as reality when it aired oh, on no. the UPN. So it's in cut, intercut with actual UFO experts. So what you're seeing is kind of a War of the Worlds thing where you think it's real. Every once in a, and I remember watching this. I was just turning channels in 1998. It came upon this thing, and I thought it was like a 2020 documentary, and it was freaking me out for a well, little. Well, the Discover Channel was doing crap like that for a while. The the whole thing on mermaids, like they were filming it like it was a real documentary. And, and then we had like that some, the megalodon it, thing. On the track. megalodon one. That one. That one. I think I. It was the next day where I was like, that couldn't have been real. Yeah. But yeah. But so this alien thing, yeah. abduction. Alien Abduction Incident in Lake County. This is on YouTube. So anybody out there can watch along with us. It's like 45 minutes. And 
I watched this, and when I saw Signs years later, you thought I, that there there's was a lot of stuff in Signs that I think comes right from this special. So I okay. think M Night must have seen okay. it at some point. Oh, interesting. All right, I'm I'm in. I'll check it out. Listen, I'm all about alien abductions, Bigfoot. Uh, so speaking of Netflix, Umbrella Academy is another based on a graphic novel. It's a series coming out yes. in mid February, which may be something we could look into. Okay. Since at this point, who knows when season two of Lost in Space is coming out? <laughs> Has that been announced? I know. It's I don't know. It's like it's like we got like seven seasons of Jessica Drew Jones or whatever you want to call it, and yet Lost in Space, which was phenomenal. Yeah, I think that that'll season one will deserve a, a re a review. We'll have to because I don't remember anything that happened at this point. <laughs> so there you go. So, that's yeah. that's our show. Um, Glass, Unbreakable, and uh, Split. And the next week, Bird Box. We're gonna do it. A little bit, a little behind the eight ball, but we'll do it. Yes, we will. Yes, and thanks for sticking then, in with us. I think this may have been our longest episode yet. Uh oh, oh geez, and it's only two of us. Mike, that's that's why Mike didn't want to be a part of it. He's like, oh, these two are just gonna go on and on about this movie. Well, hopefully, he'll watch Bird Box. Hopefully, he will. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, Mike and feel better. All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much for listening. And we that's will it. be with you next week. Yes. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Now, I would like a PB and J sandwich. I don't know.